morning everyone. So, today we are going to continue with concurrency control and uh, finish up with recovery and your lab session today also uses um, uh, you know covers these two areas. Covering concurrency control in the lab is a interesting exercise, because it means you have to start up multiple windows in parallel and uh, run queries and you can observe what is going on. So, your lab today has several exercises, which require you to do such things. Observing recovery in the lab is a lot harder, because it is hard to crash the database. The database generally does not crash. Uh, you will have to physically reboot the machine, uh, if you really want to test it. And even then, it is hard to see what exactly was happening, what happens during recovery. It is all hidden. So, we do not have a, a detailed uh, lab on recovery. Although, uh, we have a few exercises, which uh, show you what happens when a transaction rolls back. So, there is not much lab work on the recovery front, uh, but certainly uh, the concepts are very important to understand how databases do what they are doing. Now, some of these uh, concepts in recovery are used not only in databases, but they are used in many other settings including operating systems, uh, distributed data storage systems and many other places. So, they have a fairly wide applicability and uh, that is an extra reason why we study uh, recovery in the context of database systems in a course. Okay. So, let us start off by perhaps taking any questions that people have from yesterday. So, if you have a question, please raise the AVU flag or send the question by chat and I will be happy to spend a few minutes taking questions from yesterday's topics. I see a flag up from Anna University, Chennai. Anna University, do you have a question? If you do, please go ahead. Regarding the quiz 2 of our yesterday, uh, how are uh, organizing the transactions, how to group the read and write order in T1 and T2? Okay. The question was, uh, in the quiz yesterday, how do you decide on the order of T1 and T2? Okay. I assume you talked of uh, this particular schedule and the question was, how do you decide the order of T 1 and T 2? So, uh, what happens is, in, in this case, we are trying to understand what happened. This is not what actually happens when the database is executing uh, in the following sense. Uh, what you see here is a schedule, which could occur when a database is executing. So, we are trying to see if the schedule is serializable or not. So, this checking whether it is serializable or not does not actually happen in a real database system, because we already follow protocols, which guarantee serializability or perhaps some weak forms of serializability. So, what we are doing here is, uh, we are trying to understand how to make sure that a schedule will be serializable. And what we did is, we looked at example schedules and then saw, uh, you know, can we swap instructions and make them serializable. Now, uh, there is no specific algorithm here for it, although you could uh, I am sure come up with the algorithm, it is not of any importance. What is important is to understand what you can swap in these examples, so that you can understand when a schedule is serializable and when it is not. Now, among the things which we uh, did not cover in uh, detail, uh, we will talk about it if time permits, is uh, given a schedule that is produced by a particular concurrency control mechanism, how do we show that that schedule will be serializable? To understand that, we have to know what are the operations, we have to know what it takes for a schedule to become serializable by swapping instructions and so forth. So, that is basically what our goal is when we deal with these examples. So, in this particular case, we could see it and uh, figure out that we can swap the first instruction of T 2 and the second instruction of T 1 and come up with a schedule where T 1 is first and then T 2. If you want to do this in general, if you are given an arbitrary schedule and you want to know is it serializable uh, and if it is, what is a corresponding serial order for this schedule? There is a way to do it and that way is to introduce, uh, is to create a graph where the transactions are nodes and there is an edge between any two transactions. It is a directed edge from T i to T j if T i did some operation first and T j did a conflicting operation afterwards. 
So, what does that mean? If T i did a write and then T j did a read, there is an edge from T i to T j. If T i did a read and then T j did a write, then also there is an edge from T i to T j in the order in which it happened in the schedule. And finally, if both of them did a write, again there is an edge from uh, T i to T j if T i did the write first and then T j did the write. So, what we have here is a graph with transactions as nodes and the edges indicate a precedence order forced by this schedule. So, what we do is construct this graph and then we want to see if there is an ordering of the nodes which are transactions here, which uh, does not conflict with any of the edges. So, this turns out to be a, a, a basically a topological sorting if you are familiar with it. If you are not, do not worry. Uh, it is a fairly straightforward way of taking a graph and ordering the nodes such that any edges in the graph go from a lower numbered node to a higher numbered node. In other words, the lower numbered node would come first in the serial order, the higher numbered node would come later in the serial order. So, any ed conflict edges, remember the conflict edges are created from the schedule and indicate that one of the transactions ran first, then the other did that operation. And if you uh, can order the nodes of the graph such that all these edges are going forward from a lower number to higher number, then everything is fine. Now, of course, there are graphs where we cannot actually do this, because for example, there is a cycle in the graph. There is a cycle which means that uh, T 1 uh, did something before T 2 in the order of you know T 1 read something which then T 2 wrote or any of the other conflicts. Eventually, you can have a cycle. If you do not do concurrency control, a schedule can have a cycle. Such a schedule is not serializable. In fact, it has been shown that it is exactly equivalent. If you can uh, order the nodes of the graph such that um, you know edges are always going forward, that is the same as uh, saying that the graph has no cycles, which is the same as saying the schedule is serializable. However, uh, in a practical situation, nobody is actually going to create the graph and then sort the nodes because we already have a concurrency control mechanism in place. So, this is more for formally proving things about this. In theory, you can have a concurrency control manager which actually constructs this graph and then decides whether to allow an operation or not, but the overheads would be tremendous. So, nobody actually does anything like this. Okay. I hope that answered your question. Uh, back to you if you have a follow up question. Hello ma'am. So, good morning. This is about the transactions. That is in real time, uh, we face a problem in uh, ATM. That is uh, even before getting the amount in hand, we uh, it is as though our tables are updated that we have retrieved it. So, what exactly happens internally? Thanks. That was a very good question and something which uh, anyone who learns about transactions ought to wonder about. And the question is, if you go to an ATM and withdraw money, um, then how does the you know there is an order there are two things which happen one is that it gives you the money the other is it debits the amount from your account the question is how can you guarantee atomicity what if you uh, if the atm first deducts the amount from your balance and then doesn't give you cash you are going to be very unhappy or what if it gives you the cash and then is not able to uh, deduct the money from your account, the bank will be unhappy. And in fact, if you think about it, these are two separate actions. One is updating a bank account somewhere and the other is physically handing out cash here. So, it is actually impossible to actually do this atomically. Even inside a database, nothing is really atomic. You get the illusion of atomicity by rolling back actions which happen in the database. Now, it is easy to roll back an action in the database because uh, you know, we will see how to do this using logs, but how do you roll back an action outside the database and how do you even detect that something went wrong? How does the database know that the money was not actually paid out to the customer? And there are actually several mechanisms for this. The ATM itself is able to will keep a log of when the cash is actually handed out. So, the transaction is split into two steps. The first step goes and uh, contacts the bank actually if the bank is not contactable, uh, most ATMs will give you the cash anyway, assuming that you are not cheating. And what it will do is, it will first contact the bank and um, it will 
tell the bank deduct this much amount which was requested. The bank will confirm yes, the account has enough balance, I am deducting it, go ahead. When the ATM receives the go ahead, it will uh, actually dispense the cash and it will record the fact that it dispensed the cash somewhere. Now, you may have observed um, current ATMs will give you all your cash together as one single wad of money. There were ATMs before which would go you know release one note at a time, fut, 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 one note after another comes out. Now, think in that older ATM, you may have a situation where power goes off, actually they have UPSs and so on, but let us say the machine crashes or whatever after giving you five notes, but not giving you the other five notes, which it was supposed to give you. That makes life more complicated. So, what it has done is, it has actually turned giving you the cash, the actual physical act of delivering you the cash into one atomic operation, which is a whole bundle comes out. Now, there are still potential problems. What if um, something went wrong uh, after it counted the notes, but before it gave it to you? The ATM will generally have its own log of when operations happen. So, when it spews out the money, it will log saying the money was dispensed. Now, supposing there was a failure at that point, the ATM uh, is brought back up and it says, wait, um, it appears that the uh, something was in progress, it, it records what was in progress. So, it says there was a transaction in progress, but I did not hand out the cash. So, at this point, it can uh, send a uh, uh, note in effect back to the bank saying this particular transaction did not work out, I could not hand out the cash and then the bank will put the money back. But if in between you went to the bank and said what is my balance, the bank will say you know you withdrew uh, you know 10,000 rupees from this ATM and you will say no I did not get that money and you can have a fight with the bank manager, it will get resolved eventually. So, there is a temporary inconsistency which eventually will get resolved. Assuming that the machine did not completely go mad, it did record the fact that it was going to give you the cash, but did not give you. Now, there are certain situations where some mechanical error happens and the ATM thinks it gave you the cash, but you did not get it. What do you do in such situations? There are actually uh, litigations which go on and banks have an interesting mechanism to deal with this. Most ATMs, I think pretty much maybe all ATMs these days have a small camera uh, and they are actually recording what is going on. And as a result, if uh, you actually got the cash and then you say you did not get it, the bank has a video record to show that you got the cash. On the other hand, if you did not get the cash, uh, the bank can look at that video record and say yes, it is clear that uh, this customer did not receive the cash, so we will refund the account. So, the video recording is in some sense a log of what happened and it can be used to recover. So, this is actually uh, quite interesting. So, there are different notions of a log. A log says what happened and helps you uh, undo or redo events. So, what we have now is a video log, we are at a higher level. That log is not something the machine can use automatically and do recovery, but humans can do recovery at a higher level. So, this in fact is actually characteristic of many systems. Certain failures in fact, most failures will be handled at a certain level. If it cannot, that failure is reflected up to the next level. That next level will try to deal with it. If it cannot, it will be pushed up to the next level and so forth. As an example, uh, maybe the human says, look I received money, but uh, you cheated, you gave me only 9000 rupees, not 10,000. Now, what does the bank do? The log does not have enough information to see exactly how many notes you got. And then it goes up to maybe the next level manager who uh, tries to see is this person uh, likely to be trying to con the bank or is this person honest. They will check the machine and eventually they will come to a decision and either say ok, we think you are telling the truth, here is 1000 rupees or they will say ok, we think you are lying, go away, you can sue us in court if you want. And then the court is the next level of recovery uh, in case the person is mad with the bank. So, as you can see there are multiple levels of recovery, any real system actually has to have such levels. Hope that answered your question, uh, back to you. Sir, I would like to know the difference between a serial schedule and a serializable schedule, over to you sir. Ok, the question is what is the difference between a serial schedule and a serializable schedule? A serial schedule is one where the transactions run one after another. So, in a serial schedule, there is no concurrency. 
first one transaction runs, it completes, it commits or rolls back. Then another transaction starts, it completes, either commits or rolls back, and then the next one and so on. So, they are one after the other. This is a serial schedule. In contrast, what we are trying to say is, look, for performance reasons, we want schedules where instructions of different transactions are interleaved, but the schedule is somehow equivalent to a serial schedule. So, it is not actually serial, but it is equivalent to some serial schedule. So, the notion of serializable is that this schedule is not necessarily serial, but we can move the instructions around in a manner that conflicts are not violated and come to a serial schedule. In other words, we can show that there is some serial schedule, which is equivalent to this particular schedule. So, then this particular schedule is not serial, but it is said to be serializable. So, that is the difference between serial, which is actually serial and serializable, which is not actually serial, but can be shown to be equivalent to a serial schedule. Back to you, if you have any follow up questions. Good morning, sir. So, we have a diode and drive regeneration system. So, there we have an option of selecting the DC uh, seat by paying an extra amount of 10 rupee or so. If that is done, that is the same seat number which we get in our bureau or journal. But if we do not select our seat and if we leave it to the automatic uh, selection, I get a seat number in, in my e regulation, but in the actual uh, thing, during my journey, I get a different seat number. What may be the use of this discrepancy between seat numbers? Okay. The audio was not very clear. I understood that the question was something about uh, going to a airline system and they allow you to uh, choose a seat number by paying a little extra money. Um, the last part was not very clear. I think what you said is that uh, sometimes you choose a seat number, but uh, when you actually see the seat allocated, it is not the same. Is that your question? Back to you to confirm or uh, reply otherwise. So, the question was uh, correctly understood that it was in private information. It is in private information system. Okay. So, it is not an airline reservation system, it is a railway reservation system. Okay. So, then uh, this is a good question. So, in a railway reservation system, if you are, um, let us say there are two modes. One is an online mode, where you are first uh, entering all your data. That part is still not started a transaction. It is collected all the information required to run a transaction. Then the system uh, says, uh, yes, I have seats available. Uh, go ahead and make a payment. Now, you do an online credit card payment, it takes a few seconds, then you come back and by then something could have changed. Now, there are two possible options for running a system like this. One is the moment the reservation system hands you over to the, uh, you know, tells you that there is a seat available. From there till the point where you finish the credit card payment, it can lock those seats, meaning it sets aside that many seats for you. So, once your payment is successful, it will give you those seats. But there is a problem with this, uh, especially towards the end. Um, if many people are uh, trying to grab the last few seats and somebody sees uh, that there are five seats and then goes away and the terminal is still hanging there, they have not completed their booking. These five seats cannot be given to anybody else until something happens here. That is a very, very bad idea. You do not want to do that. So, what this means is that a transaction, if it if its boundary extends beyond what happens in the database, but actually goes and covers what a human is doing outside of the database, such transactions are called long running transactions. So, they involve a database lookup or update, human making a decision, coming back and then another database update typically. Such transactions, if they have to be atomic, cost of concurrency is very, very high. It will seriously affect the functioning of the system. So, pretty much no system in the world lets you do such things, except in a few cases where uh, when you do a, a booking, a hotel booking, uh, they may say, okay, you have, uh, you know, 20 minutes to complete this booking. So, uh, if airlines used to do this. You could make a booking without making the payment and then they would say, you have five days to complete this booking till then we will hold the seat for you. These days they do not do that. So, there are situations where you have such uh, long running transactions, but in most cases 
uh, they are not used. So, what this means is after you make the payment and you go to the next screen, uh, by then somebody else may have also seen there were 5 seats left and booked 5 seats their uh, credit card payment or whatever went through fast and they got those 5 seats. You also saw there were 5 seats, but by the time your payment is processed, those 5 seats are gone and then the system says sorry. Now, how do you recover in such situations? In such cases, you will go back, I mean you meaning the reservation system will go back and uh, will tell you look, this did not work out, shall I refund the amount? and at that point they will refund the amount to your credit card. So, these are transactions which are actually separate transactions, they are committed. If you meanwhile ask the credit card company, they will say yes a charge for uh, 1000 rupees was made. Um, so, you are able to observe the internal state which means it is not really one, the whole procedure is not one transaction, it is split into small transactions and if something goes wrong, you have to go back and compensate for an earlier transaction. Note that compensate is different from undo. It is kind of similar, the semantically to humans it seems the same, but in recovery terminology undo or rollback means that it is not yet committed and we can undo the changes which it made partially. In contrast, compensate means it was committed already. Now, we have to run a fresh transaction to basically uh, negate the whatever the first one did. So, if a credit card charge was made, a credit card refund is done to compensate. So, uh, such compensation is fairly common. In, in other words, when there are transactions which span human interaction, any long transaction, you pretty much have to commit and then compensate. That is the only way uh, most systems in the world run. So, again this is a nice question because it illustrates the fact that the notion of transaction and atomicity and so on are actually pervasive. They are all around us. And what we see in the database and study in concurrency control and recovery is one small part of it which is inside the database. But when you build an application, you also have to think about this uh, bigger uh, picture which is spanning user interaction. Okay. So, thanks, there is a good set of questions. Um, in the interest of time, I am not going to take any more questions. Okay. To recall where we were yesterday, uh, we had looked at uh, locking and in particular at the two phase locking protocol. And if you recall, uh, it has a growing phase where transactions obtain locks and then a shrinking phase where they release locks. And once the first lock is released, no more locks can be obtained. And in reality, what is implemented is strict two phase locking at a minimum, which in which uh, exclusive locks are held till the end of transaction and um, uh, shared locks can be released after the lock point. But most uh, real implementations actually implement rigorous two phase locking, where all locks are held till the end and then released at the end. Now, why do they implement this? Uh, simply because any um, SQL engine, you know, there is a sequence of operations which it receives, which are part of a transaction. It really has no idea what you will do next. So, so far it has received three queries, and next it may receive an update, it may receive a query, it does not know. It has to obtain locks for those. As a result, it cannot release locks early. As a result, most real implementations will release the lock only when you say commit or roll back. So, now um, let us look a little bit about uh, how locking is done practically. So, practically the first time uh, the, the engine tries to read a tuple, it would get a shared lock on it. If it knows it is going to update the tuple, it will get an x lock. But you may have a situation where you have two SQL queries. The first one reads a tuple, the second one goes and updates the same tuple. So, now what happens is that you may ask for an x lock on something on which you already have an s lock. Now, it looks like s and x locks conflict, but hey it is the same transaction. So, there is no real conflict within the same transaction. In other words, what you want to do is you have an s lock, now you want to upgrade it to an x lock. Okay. So, this is called a lock conversion. So, it is called an upgrade and pretty much all systems support this because all they see is a sequence of queries. Each query does a read or a write correspondingly uh, they get s locks or x locks and if they already had an s lock, it is an upgrade. 
Now, if you want to do two phase locking, in other words, if you have more control and you say that, okay, now I will not acquire any more locks, I can release locks. There is a form of release which is not a complete release. You can release the exclusive lock and go down to shared lock, which is called lock downgrade. This is consistent with two phase locking, but again, as you can imagine, if you release an X lock before you commit, you are asking for trouble because somebody will read uncommitted data and then it will be, uh, there will either be cascading rollbacks or in fact, it would not be recoverable. So, practically speaking, upgrades are what matter, not downgrades. So, there is a, a few pieces of code which indicate how this upgrade uh, happens. Uh, in fact, lock acquisition happens. Uh, the database receives read and write operations and there is a layer which automatically obtains whatever locks are required as it gets read and write operations, read and write on tuples. So, I am going to uh, skip these details, uh, but I will just note that whenever you ask for a lock, you may have to wait. In locking, that is the basic property that if somebody else has a conflicting lock, you may have to wait. So, you will wait and eventually it will be your turn and then you go ahead or in some cases you will be rolled back. I am going to skip the details of acquisition of a lock and point out that any database system has a module called a lock manager, which does all this. Now, if you uh, think about the lock manager as a separate process to which you send requests and it sends uh, replies back to you, that is a nice uh, model um, conceptually. But practically, there are overheads to having a separate process to which you send messages and get replies back. It could be a separate thread, but a separate process has overheads. So, what typically is done in most database systems is anyway, there is shared memory in the database, shared among all the processes that are accessing the database. So, what they do is they stick a data structure called a lock table in shared memory. The lock table has information about all locks which have been granted currently. And when a transaction wants to get a lock, it can actually go through the lock table and see if it can grab the lock and update the lock table or it waits till somebody releases the lock and then it can update the lock table to indicate it got the lock. So, it is kind of a cooperative thing. There is no separate manager. Each transaction has code in a library which uh, accesses the lock table and updates it. Of course, if two transactions update the lock table at the same time, there is trouble. So, all databases have actually two levels of locking. One is this uh, you know database tuple level locking, which we are studying. Another is a lower level of temporary locks, which are obtained. So, that two transactions do not simultaneously update a shared data structure. The lock table is one such example. It is a shared data structure. So, there is actually a semaphore or mutual, mutex as it is called, uh, which you can also think of as a lock, which is not two phase. So, that is actually uh, grabbed by any transaction, which wants to update the lock table. It does its update, releases that mutex or semaphore or short term lock and then proceeds. So, that is a different form of locking, which does not itself have to be two phase. So, then we uh, saw earlier that whenever there is locking, there can be deadlock. We had an uh, example of a situation um, where two transactions are running. Um, they request locks which conflict with each other and land up in a deadlock. So, how do you deal with deadlocks? One way is to uh, try to come up with a protocol which ensures that there is no deadlock. In fact, for a specific domains, if you are building a application where you know what are all the transactions and it is a simple application, you may be able to do something to prevent deadlocks. And what is that something? A simple way is if you can order all the items which you are ever going to access sequentially and what you will do is you will only request locks in the correct order. You will never go out of order. So, if you can order items like this and ac access them or access the or get the locks in the correct order, then we can show that deadlocks will never happen. Even though you use two phase locking, you impose a little bit of extra uh, rules on the way you access 
locks to ensure there is no deadlock. I would not get into the details, but it is not hard to show that if the items are ordered and locks can only be accessed in order. Meaning, if I get a lock on some item, I can never ask for a lock on an earlier item after that. I can ask only for locks on later items subsequently. Furthermore, I cannot even upgrade the lock for the same item from S to X. As an example, if two people lock the same item in S mode and then both of them try to upgrade it to X, they will deadlock on a single item. Both have the shared lock, neither can get the X lock, immediate deadlock. So, under certain fairly strict rules, we can show that uh, deadlocks cannot happen. And they are actually quite useful. There are applications which can minimize or totally avoid deadlocks by doing this, but the programmer has to be careful. So, how do you detect deadlocks? Um, deadlock detection is uh, based on creating a weights for graph. It is a graph with nodes as transactions. This is similar to what I told you in the beginning today, where the graph had transactions as nodes. There, the, an edge from one transaction to another indicated a conflict, meaning this transaction did something on some item and that other one did a conflicting thing afterwards. Here, it is different. Here, an edge from one transaction to another means that the first transaction uh, has a lock, um, the, sorry, this one. Uh, let us take this case, I will make it clear. There is a edge from T 18 to T 20. What that means is that T 20 has a lock, which T 18 wants and the lock which it wants is conflicting with the lock that T 20 holds. In other words, T 18 is now waiting for T 20 to release the lock. So, this graph is called a weights for graph. So, now you can build this weights for graph. Every time a transaction wants to get a lock, it cannot proceed. You have to add a node in the weights for graph to indicate what all transactions this is waiting for. If two transactions have a shared lock and a third transaction now wants an x lock, it is now waiting for both of them. So, you can build this graph and you can actually uh, check if this graph has a cycle. If it has a cycle, that means A is waiting for B, B is waiting for C, C is waiting for A. There is no way they can progress. So, if a cycle is there, you have a deadlock situation and you have to abort one of those transactions. In contrast, if there is no cycle in the graph, yes, some transactions are waiting, but eventually it is possible that the uh, one of the transactions, uh, which is not waiting for anybody, will release its lock, allowing the next one to go ahead and so forth. So, if there is no cycle, the system is still safe you do not have to do anything, but the moment there is a cycle detected, you have to roll back a transaction. So, every database system which implements locking has a deadlock detection mechanism built in and that mechanism is actually based on building a graph like this and looking for cycles. There are some cheaper heuristics, but this is uh, what most systems do. Luckily, these graphs are not very big because how many transactions typically run concurrently? You know, if you have 10, 20 transactions running concurrently, that is already a fairly a highly concurrent system. So, a graph with 10, 20 nodes and detecting cycles in it is not too expensive. So, what do you do when there is a deadlock? You can completely roll back the transaction, but another option which is possible in some cases is a partial rollback. So, that you release, what is the partial rollback? Well, as you went forward, you acquired locks and did updates. A partial rollback undoes the updates and releases the locks going backwards in order of what the transaction did till a point where some lock has been released, which now resolves the deadlock cycle. Now, the transaction again go forward, but it is actually hard to code such transactions, which can roll back partially and then again execute going forward. Think about it. If you are writing a JDBC program, how on earth can the database tell you well, you did these three steps, now I have undone the last two steps, go back to the first step and start again. JDBC does not provide you any such feature in its API. So, partial rollback conceptually is fine, but practically it is not very widely used. So, I mentioned something about deadlocks and transactions waiting. So, here is a quick quiz. Here is a schedule um, where uh, 
T 1 has got an S lock on A, T 2 has got an S lock on B and oh wait a minute, there is a typo here, uh, beg your pardon. Uh, T 1 has got, uh, has requested an X lock on B. Now, can it actually get the X lock at this point? It cannot, because T 2 already has an S lock. So, it is waiting and this one should have been lock X of A. Okay. So, let me write out the thing over here. So, if you see the instructions here, a lock instruction is basically a request to get a lock. That does not mean it will be granted. It will be granted immediately if nobody else has a conflicting lock. If not, the transaction has to wait. Okay. So, I uh, will uh, come back to the quiz question later, but just note this correction. This right bottom instruction should have been lock x of a. So, what I suggest is you note the answer on paper and I will give you a chance to enter the answer later. So, the options are the schedule is not two phase, the schedule is deadlocked, the schedule is not deadlocked and none of the above. Those are the four options. Uh, do not enter the options yet, it is going to take a few minutes, but please note on paper what is the option and I will we'll come back to it in a few minutes. Okay, so, far so good. The next topic, which I am just going to point you to, but do not have time to cover is what is called multiple granularity locking. So far, we assume that we are going to read a tuple and we are going to lock the tuple. This is fine uh, up to some point, but supposing a transaction needs to read every tuple in a relation and it is a very, very large relation, millions of tuples. If it gets a lock on each tuple one at a time, it has to put an entry in the lock table as I said the lock table is in shared memory. Now, if you have millions and millions of tuples, this shared memory is going to get full with lock information. Now, what do you do? You can say write part of the lock table to disk, but it is actually fairly silly. You are putting a lot of effort into locking each individual tuple, when actually you know very well that this transaction is reading all the tuples or most of the tuples in the relation. So, why cannot this transaction lock the whole relation? So, now what we have is relation level locking. On the other hand, if every transaction by default only locked relations, even if it updates or reads one tuple, if it locks the whole relation, that is bad. You have a situation where two transactions are reading and writing completely different tuples, but because they locked at the relation level, uh, the lock manager says, wait, you are conflicting, one of you has to wait or you are deadlocked, you have to die which is completely unnecessary because they never even looked at the same data. So, what we have is a trade off. There are cases where you want to lock at the level of a relation. There are cases where you want to lock at the relation level of individual tuples. Can you do this adaptively depending on the need? And that is exactly the idea of multiple grand variety locking. The idea is that um, a transaction can choose to lock at the level of tuples it can choose to lock at the level of relations. Uh, in fact, there may be other levels in between, but let us keep life simple. And it can in fact, do this adaptively. It can even change its mind and it has locked tuples. Now, it wants to lock a relation that is also possible. The question is how do you implement this effectively? So, as an example, um, supposing uh, transactions has locked a few tuples in exclusive mode a new transaction comes and says, I want to lock the relation in shared mode. If you look at that, uh, what locks they are requesting, one is on the relation, one is on tuples. If you are not careful, you will say, wait, these are two separate things, let this guy go ahead. But in fact, there is a problem. When you give a lock on the relation, what you have done is, you have given a lock on every single tuple in that relation. What the lock manager just did is, it gave an S lock on a tuple on which some other transaction had an X lock. That is a mistake, it should not be doing that. So, the question is, how does the lock manager actually know that 
somebody has a lock on individual tuples and then it makes sure that it does not grant a lock on the relation. And there is a very efficient way of doing this by recording what are called intention locks. That is, even if you are locking tuples, you will kind of leave a flag behind at the relation level saying that I am getting an intention lock on this relation. It is a new type of lock, which basically says I am actually going to lock some data below individual tuples. So, now if somebody else comes and asks for a conflicting intention lock on the relation, you will say no, 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 wait, somebody is already uh, locking individual tuples, you will conflict, you have to wait. Okay. So, that is the idea of multiple granularity locking and details are there in the book if you are interested. The next topic in uh, concurrency control is actually a very important topic. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I had a choice given the time constraints of how much detail to go into timestamp based protocols and how much to go into another protocol, which is also based partially on timestamps called snapshot isolation. So, given the constraints, I decided that I will give a very quick overview of the basic timestamp based protocols and then focus more on snapshot isolation. Uh, partially because snapshot isolation is relatively new uh, in terms of textbook coverage. It has actually been implemented for a while in database systems, um, but most textbooks did not pay too much attention to it. Um, but we have introduced it, we, we mentioned it a bit last time around in the previous edition. In this edition, we have expanded coverage of snapshot isolation because more and more databases are now supporting it. So, I am going to spend more time on that. But before that, let me quickly cover what is timestamp based protocols. In the basic timestamp protocols, each transaction is assigned a timestamp when it enters the system. So, you can read the clock and if two transactions come so fast that the clock did not change in between, you can actually add some other bits to make them unique. So, each transaction has a unique timestamp which it got. In fact, you do not have to read the clock. You can have a counter and each time a transaction comes in, you update the counter. That is actually much easier and that is what systems really do. Even though it is called a timestamp, it is a logical timestamp. It need not be a physical timestamp. It is simply a counter 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. So, uh, any transaction which comes in later will have a higher timestamp. So, now, given that each transaction has a timestamp, the job of the concurrency control manager here is to ensure that the serial order of transactions matches the timestamp. That is the decision we have made. So, the timestamp protocol has decided up front that any serial ordering will be consistent with the timestamp. In other words, if any tra two transactions execute a pair of conflicting operations in an order which violates their timestamp ordering, then one of them has to be rolled back. That is the key idea. So, um, how do you implement this idea? The idea is clear. Whenever you detect a conflict, which is going to happen because a read or write has been requested, at that point you see if um, the conflict is such that the one which executed first had the lower timestamp and the one which has made the request now has a higher timestamp, then it is ok. In other words, the lower timestamp one did the operation, say a write, and the higher timestamp one now wants to read it that is ok. But if you find that the higher timestamp transaction had done the write and the lower number transaction now wants to read the same item, there is a problem. If you allow it to proceed, the lower numbered one has read something which was written by a higher numbered one, which means the serial order would be flipped. The uh, lower numbered one would come later in the serial order than the higher numbered one. So, that is bad. The serial order has to respect the uh, timestamp order. So, in this case, if as an example, T 10 wrote a data item and now T 5 wants to read it, T 5 is told sorry, it has been updated by a later guy, you have to roll back. That is a basic idea. It is symmetric. If T 10 wants to write something which T 5 wrote, that is fine. It is allowed uh, to go ahead. If T 10 wants to uh, read something which T 5 wrote, that is also ok. But if T 5 now wants to write something 
which T 10 has already read. What does that mean? So, T 5 is writing, T 10 already read it. If the serial ordering is respected, T 10 should have read the value which T 5 is now trying to write, but it is too late. T 10 has already read the value. Therefore, you have a choice. You can roll back T 10 or you can roll back T 5 and the choice normally is the one which is requesting the action T 5 is requesting the action of writing T you have to detect that T 10 already read it and roll back T 5. This is what the protocol has to enforce. The question is how does it enforce this and the answer is for each data item uh, we are going to call data items Q the system maintains two timestamps. The right timestamp Q is the largest timestamp of any transaction that successfully wrote Q. The read timestamp of Q is the largest timestamp of any transaction that successfully read Q. So, when the read or write is successful, the timestamp is updated so that it is always the largest one. So, that is what is required. Now, here is the details of the protocol. So, supposing a transaction T i issues read Q. If the timestamp of T i is less than the right timestamp of Q, what does that mean? It means that T i is trying to read something which a higher number transaction already wrote. So, the old value is gone now, it is no longer available. So, T i will be forced to read a value written by somebody who is later in the serial ordering. So, that cannot happen. Therefore, the read operation is rejected and T i is rolled back. So, this is a simple test. If the timestamp of for a read, if timestamp is less than right timestamp of the op data item being read, this is Q, then you roll back. Now, if on the other hand, the timestamp of T i is greater than or equal to the right timestamp of Q, that is the else case, then you allow the read to proceed, there is no problem. But you have to do one more step, you have to update the read timestamp if required. So, the read timestamp of data item Q is set to the maximum of its current read timestamp and the timestamp of T i. Why is this max required? Let us say that a data item had been read by T 7. So, its timestamp read timestamp is now 7. Now, T 5 comes in and reads the same data item. There is no problem, T 5 can go ahead, but the timestamp of that data item has to remain as 7, not as 5. So, we will take the maximum of its current read timestamp 5, T s of T i which is uh, sorry maximum is the original one was 7 and the new one is 5, the maximum is 7. So, we do not actually update it, we leave it as 7. So, that is the protocol for read. The protocol for write is fairly similar to this. So, first of all uh, you check if the write uh, the timestamp of the operation which wants to do the write that is over here. T s of T i is less than read timestamp of Q. What does that mean? You have let us say T 5 which wants to write it and some other transaction T 8 already read Q, which means it is too late. T 8 should have got the value which was written by T 5, but it has already read some other older value. So, it cannot do it. So, in that case uh, the write operation is rejected and T i is rolled back. So, that is a simple case. Now, um, here is another possibility. Let us say this test succeeded. So, the read timestamp of Q is uh, uh, we know that um, it is less than the right the, than the current guy who is trying to write it. What if it is equal? If read timestamp is equal to the timestamp of the new transaction, that is ok because it is the same transaction. So, that is also ok. So, if read timestamp is less or equal, there is no problem. Okay. Now, the next test is to compare with the right timestamp. Timestamp of the transaction which is trying to do the write is less than the right timestamp of Q. What does that mean? Okay. That means that let us say T 7 already wrote the data item and now T 5 wants to write it. If you allow it to proceed, the final value will be that of T 5, not of T 7. So, you cannot allow it to proceed. So, the protocol in this version says uh, sorry you reject the write operation and roll it back. I am going to come back to this step in just a minute, um, but assuming all of this is ok, 
then you complete the right operation and set the right time stamp of q to what to the time stamp of t i. We know that this has to be the highest numbered one to write it. So, we can directly update right time stamp of q to t i. Okay. So, uh, if I had time I would actually go through a detailed example of this protocol. There is an example, I will go through it very quickly, but um, you will have to go back and read this. If you are not familiar with this, uh, you will not be able to understand it fully, but I hope you have got the basic ideas. I will just mention here that there is a special case here that instead of rolling back T i, we can actually ignore the write, just say forget it, there is a write which was subsequently overwritten. So, let us just forget, we will ignore this write and let the system proceed. In fact, that is correct, but it turns out if you do that, you are not ensuring conflict serializability, you are actually enforcing some other thing called view serializability, which we did not get into. Okay. So, there is a version of the timestamp protocol, which although it does not ensure conflict serializability, it enforces a weaker form, which is still good enough called view serializable. It is still serializable. Okay, here is a small example. I will just look at a small part of it. So, these are the operations which happen. T 1, T 2, T 3, T 4, T 5 are the 5 transactions which are running and those are the time stamps 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, it is possible that they all started at the same time and before these 4 could do anything, they got their time stamps, but before they could do anything else, T 5 went ahead and read x. So, going down there is a read y, read y, write y. Does this write y uh, have a problem? If you notice here, what is the read time stamp of y at this point? T 2 read y, so the read time stamp is set to 2. T 1 read y, the read time stamp is set to not to 1, to the maximum which is still 2. Now, T 3 is writing it. So, luckily the time stamp of this transaction 3 is greater than the highest number of a transaction which read it, which is 2. So, the write can proceed. At this point, the write time stamp of y is 3, the read time stamp is 2. Next, T 3 writes z. What is the write time stamp of z? Z has not been read, forget its read time stamp, set to 0, let us say. Uh, now, the write time stamp of z is set to 3. Now, proceeding further, T 5 reads z. What is the value it gets? It gets the value written by T 3 and that is ok, it can proceed. Going further, T 2 reads z and now what happens? The value of z was written by T 3, T 2 is a lower number transaction. So, it is not allowed to see anything done by T 3. So, it cannot proceed, it has to abort here. So, that is what the timestamp protocol does. But I should point out there is a small issue here. T 5 has a higher timestamp than T 3, so we allowed the read to proceed. But think what happens if T 3 now aborts? If T 5 commits and T 3 aborts here, what happens? You have a schedule which is not recoverable. So, you actually have to do something about it. You this fellow read a value which was never committed. So, you actually have to abort T 5 here. It is not shown here, but if uh, T 3 aborts, T 5 also will need to abort. So, there is a dependency there. And the correctness in terms of serializability is actually very easy to show. The correctness in terms of recoverability, well, if you just follow the protocol as I have shown, it is not recoverable, there is a problem. So, there is actually uh, extra stuff uh, which has to be added on to uh, either force cascading aborts or to uh, make transactions wait in case uh, a new transac a transaction is trying to read an uncommitted value, then it has to wait. So, extra steps are required here. As it says here, the schedule may not be cascade free and may not even be recoverable. The previous schedule is not recoverable. So, there are a couple of solutions to this. For lack of time, I am not going to get into it, but essentially it either uses some limited form of locking 
or keeps track of commit dependencies and rolls back or the solution number one is you do not do writes during the transaction, you accumulate all the writes locally and when the transaction is ready to commit, at that point you check all the writes, see if they can all complete and then do all the writes atomically at the end. So, while the transaction is doing the writes, nobody can read those data items, they have to block temporarily if they try to read it, the transaction commits and then only the writes are allowed to proceed. So, in fact, um, solution 1 and 2 are kind of related in this sense. So, again I am skipping details, if you did not understand it, do not worry, go read it up later. So, that was the timestamp based protocol. The next protocol is what is called a validation based protocol. Here, the idea is you allow transactions to run. Now, when they do a write, you do not immediately do the write, you keep the write pending, you do not write it to the database. And when the transaction says it is ready to commit, at that point you will check if these reads and writes which it did are conflicting with any other concurrent transaction and if it is then it rolls back, if there is no conflict it is allowed to commit. The question is how do you detect if it conflicts with a concurrent transaction. First of all, what is a concurrent transaction? A concurrent transaction you can define as one which was running while this one was running. Okay. So, you have to track what was running while this was running, even if it is gone, if it has committed and gone, still it was running while this one was running. So, you have to check what all, all the concurrent transactions did, which have already committed and then check whether this fellow conflicts with any of them, if so roll it back, otherwise commit it. Um, again, I am not going to get into all the details, but let me just tell you uh, how this is done at a big level. In the first phase, read and execution phase, T i reads from the database, it never writes back to the database, it writes to temporary local variables. What if it reads something which it wrote? It has to read it from its local variable, otherwise it will get an old value. So, if it, it has to first check if it wrote the item, read the value which it wrote locally. If it did not write it, go fetch it from the database, that is the first phase. The second phase is a validation phase, where it checks what other concurrent transactions did and if it is okay to commit or not. And then, if the validation succeeds, you do the write. If it does not succeed, you roll back the transaction and do not do any writes, that is easy. Now, in the basic version of the protocol, validation and writes are all done together for a transaction atomically. So, while its writes are in progress, nobody can read anything which it writes. So, how to implement this again some form of locking is required, I would not get into the details. But the basic idea is that in the simplest form, you validate and write atomically, while you are doing this, nobody else is reading anything or nobody else is validating, nobody else is writing, only one guy can do validation and while it is doing validation and writing, nobody else can read or write anything. So, that is not very good in terms of concurrency, but it is simple. Now, of course, in real life people have figured out how to do validation and writes concurrently. Again, there are a lot of details, we do not have time for that. So, I am going to skip that. This protocol by the way is called optimistic concurrency control. Since, a transaction executes fully in the hope that everything will go fine, at the very end when you know everything which it wants to do, that is when you check if everything is okay and go ahead and commit, otherwise roll back. Optimistic has been shown to work well when conflicts are rare. If there are a lot of conflicts, it does wasted effort. There is a conflict which maybe it could have detected long back, it simply postponed detecting the conflict, did a lot of work and finally detected the conflict and then rolls back. In fact, there are situations where you have a long transaction, which if you are careless here, while it runs for the long time, somebody else will come conflict with it and commit and force it to roll back repeatedly. So, in high conflict situation, uh, this protocol is actually a very bad idea, but in very low conflict situation, it works well. So, how 
how to implement it again it is based on in using two timestamps and then having uh, timestamps for data items and so on uh, or maintaining read and write sets. I am going to skip the details, you can read it from the book. 